Today we're going to talk about Johnny Depp and Amber Heard and the court case they've got going on. Maybe you've heard of it. Greg, why don't you tell us about the uh, videos you found? Yeah, so this is video from two to three days of testimony by Johnny Depp. You'll see direct and you'll see some cross and you'll be able to tell the difference fairly easily. We'll also see some clips where we cut away to Amber Heard when he's talking and we'll see somewhere they're listening to videos and that kind of thing. Just buckle up. And how did you respond to Miss Heard? So I just told her those are not my intentions, uh, you know. And at a, a certain point, you don't know what to do. I mean, it's, 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 the person is telling you, she's telling you, you don't trust me, you don't trust me, you don't trust me. And um, I, I can't speak about legal documents. I can't speak legalese. I can't explain to her these things. All I could do was try to calm her down and say that I was not out to screw her over or, or, or put her in a position that was, uh, was uncomfortable. Did that these, work? These were stock, these were normal things to do. It did not work, no. It escalated and escalated and t turned into uh, madness, chaos. All right, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, so look, there's been a lot of talk about the whole speed, the drawl that he's got, where he looks. So let me just kind of run through where these behaviors, I think, come from and why they're the baseline for him and why we've seen this kind of behavior throughout his career so we get a sense of the baseline. Okay, I think there in his accent, we've got John Lennon there, one of, the, of his heroes, clearly. It's down, it's deep. And then you've got Hunter S. Thompson as well, this look down to the side, this search for the right word, and also the madness and chaos that comes with that. So you've got a, a, a kind of a, a, a warrior poet of John Lennon there. You've got the madness and the chaos of Hunter S. Thompson, who go and watch him speak, always looking down to the sides, always carefully choosing his words. And then you've got Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones, again, kind of the spiritual father of Johnny Depp. Again, you'll see him looking down, searching for the right words, searching for the poetry and that kind of low key, too cool for school, absolutely rock and roll mentality. I think these are the three characters that we've got here sh showing up for Johnny Depp. We'll see some others as we go along, which are, you know, other kind of entities that he's performed and played. But just like any other human being on the planet, Johnny Depp is made up of of the stars in his life. He's made up of the people that he's looked to and gone, that's a behavior I should copy. That would be a great way to be, whether it's choosing lyrical words and being poetic, whether it's choosing madness and chaos, or whether it's choosing the search for the right words, the search for the poetry and the rock and roll lifestyle that goes along with that. Well, also along with that, you've got that animated face, which is clearly his experience with Tim Burton, which is, and, and then and Disney, you know, full of animation in the face and not so much until later on in his storytelling, we see the animation in the in in the hands. Uh, that's all I'm going to show you on on that. Scott, what do you think? All right. Well, I think this is what we're seeing is a hardcore introvert who's communicating the best way he can. And it's from coming from from always being locked down and being quiet, especially from when he was a kid. I don't know a whole lot about him when he was a child, but I know he had a rough time. And it was one of those situations that, that sort of made him an introvert. And he, he's trying as hard as he can to communicate. So that's why he speaks slowly. He's always done that from what I've seen because he's making sure what he's, his structure for his senses are correct before he delivers so he isn't embarrassed or nobody puts him on the spot and those kind of things. So when he's being put in a, a position where it's in court, somewhere it's really important every word do you say he's really watching what he says in his structure of the sentences? I think he's wide open. I, I don't think he's hiding anything at this point. And uh, but at the same time, I, Greg and I have talked about this as well. I think he's speaking almost through a persona or a character at this point because we're, we're there are a couple of spots where we see the real Johnny Depp in here, but I don't think this is really him. I think like you're talking about Mark, where he's using these all these influences are coming through. I think those are, are heightened to make this persona that we as the people who go to his movies and are fans and stuff, 
we expect to see of him and expect him to see him and hear him act that way. So I think um, he's working his way through this, uh, through a persona, as far as that goes. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, if you were to just say the word Depp, everybody on earth, unless they have never been around some kind of media, would know who he is. And he's a singularity. Everybody knows who he is. He can't hide anywhere. And he has a product that he sells. And that product is a very well-crafted product, whether it's intentional or it's something that's happened over these decades. Mark, I'll add one to your to your icons, Marlon Brando, the oh, yeah. slow-talking Marlon Brando. Yeah. And then enunciating. It's a beautiful example of him. And you can see it. I sent Scott a link and said, look, you can't miss this. Yeah. But even if he's got a carefully crafted persona, so what? That's what we all do. We all have an image that we portray to other people. And that image may or may not be exactly how we think inside. I will tell you that I've watched him enough to see baseline and I watched nine hours of this. So just to give you an idea, but watching him for baseline, he is, I, he does the searching for change move. He's a down accessing guy when he's thinking. And when he's thinking, he may stutter and stammer and go, no, no, no. But he will stutter, stammer, and then make hard eye contact and then make the gesture, whatever it is, either no or yes, as he's talking to you. So pretty easy to follow. He has that long, slow draw. And I think, like you said, it's from there. I also want to say one thing, guys. We all have opinions about this based on all of our experiences. And that's what we're telling you. We're not reading the guy's mind. And we're not trying to. In the beginning of this, he starts with a lip compression. Let's talk for just a second about what he's talking about here. He's starting off by saying he missed his um his, or he starting off by talking about he was trying to calm his wife down because her, his lawyers had asked her to sign a post up and he was trying to explain to her it wasn't personal and that kind of thing but he couldn't does his body language say that yeah overall it does you see he does this whole thing where he says i did what i could he starts with a lip compression he does some emotional accessing that down right he his shoulders rise in helplessness his inner brow tips rise in sorrow his head shakes no that all looks good. It all says the same thing. Everything's in unison with I tried, but I can't. And those are pretty much the kind of things we would do when we're faced with that kind of situation where we can't do anything about it. And then you see his face where he's talking about, did it work? No, that's disbelief. It didn't work. So we see all of that. Does that mean that he is being honest? I think he's being honest. It looks like it from here, but he's a hell of an actor too. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. A lot of what we're seeing here is what Jim Rohn is famous for saying, you're the cumulative average of the people that you either idolize or spend time with. <clears throat> and right here, when he says at a certain point, you don't know what to do. He's, he goes from talking about himself to using the word you, which is an IU shift. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the future, but he's socializing this issue. And I think it's unconscious behavior. It's not a conscious thing. And we're, we want to do this when we want people to identify with an experience and socializing by itself is never really deceptive uh, per se, but it can be part of a bigger cluster, which I'm not seeing any other things here to look for in a cluster. There's a micro facial expression of contempt, I think, at the, when he says the idea of screwing her over. And I think there is a little bit of contempt right there. I think he feels contemptuous about doing that. <clears throat> and then the second time something escalated, he raises his chin like this. And this is what we do to challenge or show somebody that we're not afraid. It's just this escalated. So I think he's present in the moment or in that memory. And he's, he's reliving that. And you see his body narrating the story for us, which we're, we're going to see a whole lot of here coming up, but everything's truthful here. Uh, and as you watch these depositions and any deposition, keep in mind, there's a difference between being coached or prepared for questioning and being deceptive about facts and memory. So being coached or prepared does not mean that you're lying. And how did you respond to Miss Hurd? So I just told her those are not my intentions, uh, you know. And at a, a certain point, you don't know what to do. I mean, it's, 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 it's the person is telling you, she's telling you, you don't trust me. You don't trust me. You don't trust me. And um, I, I can't speak about legal documents. I can't speak legalese. I can't explain to her these things. All I could do was try to calm her down and say that I was not out to 
screw her over or, or, or put her in a position that was, uh, was uncomfortable. Did that work? These were stock, normal things to do. It did not work, no. It escalated and escalated and to, turned into uh, madness, chaos. And uh, I, was, uh, um, I was a mess, I was a wreck. I was shaking and I just didn't understand why all this was happening. So I went behind the bar, I grabbed a bottle of vodka that was there and a shot glass and sat at the bar. She was nowhere around. And I poured myself two or three stiff shots of, uh, of the vodka. First taste of alcohol I'd had in a long time. And um, then she came down to the bar and found me there. And of course started screaming, oh, you're drinking again, yeah, the monster and all that. Um, so she reached, she, she, she walked up to me and reached and grabbed the, the bottle of vodka. And then just uh, kind of stood back and then hurled it at me. And, and it, it, uh, it just went right past my head and smashed behind me. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to start off by talking about him doing a little bit of emotional accessing, looking down right, and somebody's going to say, well, there's a monitor there. Yeah, there is, but he's not looking at that monitor. If you look at his eyes, you can see he's internal. He's not looking at the monitor. I had this the other day. Somebody said, well, there's a monitor there. Yeah, but he's not looking at it. He's looking down right, and he's thinking. He's doing emotional eye accessing, and then he goes to this thing I was talking about where he does a head shake, his brow illustration at nowhere around as he's doing internal conversation. As he gets upset and more, he draws his lips back a little bit. It's a little tough to tell with facial hair, but you see him draw his lips back as if he's needing some kind of reinforcement there. And then he goes to his baseline of counting change or searching for change. He's looking down left, down right, down left, down right. And then when he said she came down, he makes solid eye contact with his brow up and that confirming nod. We're seeing his baseline here. So if his baseline is here, highly likely, and I'm not talking about his baseline for just everyday conversation, I'm talking about in interviews, everywhere you see him. If you go watch 10 interviews, that's what you'll see as a baseline. He does show some residual emotion or acting, whatever you wanna call it, out the action that she said with disgust and you're the monster. You'll regret using that word monster at a later point in these interviews or in these questioning, but he shows then some apprehension. And when he talks about the bottle smashing behind him as his lips narrow and his and his nostrils flare but through this whole thing he's got a low blink rate and low respiration good indicator he's not feeling a whole lot of stress here chase what do you got yeah right at that right at that exact moment he's quoting her saying you're drinking again he shows disgust on his face like what he was seeing through her so his narration doesn't only go to him he's narrating what was on her face and when he's talking about this monster greg i think i agree with you his eyes are closed with this head shaking movement. And I think it's something he actually doesn't want to recall and he doesn't want to bring this topic up, but I think he's trying to lay it all out. And I'll, we'll talk more about this little pattern and what this behavioral pattern actually means in a minute. <clears throat> but this monster is a familiar theme to both him and her. Uh, apparently, I think it likely revolves around this drinking or drugs. And I think it also suggests there's a strong dissociative capacity for depth. A lot of actors, especially the A-list actors, have a dissociative capacity to play these roles, especially some of these ones that are really hard to do. And this dissociative capacity doesn't leave their body when they walk off set in Hollywood. So right when he says she walked up to me, grabbed the bottle, he goes back to edit a couple of details right there. But this is truthful in adding relevance and recollection because this movement <clears throat> and uncertainty about her approach was relevant to him. He wasn't sure what was going to go on. And he shows body narration in here, same way he showed us disgust on his face. And when he said it's right past my head, smashed behind me, he orients himself spatially before recalling the movement of the bottle. This is a perfect example of truth telling, according to me anyway, 
a story would have had would have details that Depp didn't witness. It smashed on the wall behind me. He didn't say the wall. He just said it smashed behind me. There's little things like that that help us to understand and comprehend what we're really seeing here. He's recalling the bottle smashing behind him, not the third person view that most people would default to, like a movie camera or something like that. And if you watch his deposition from way back, it's the exact same hand gesture, the exact same hand gesture that bottle flying past his head. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I would agree. So, uh, uh, Greg, he's he's not looking down at the monitor there. If he was, you would see micro movements with his eyes as he tracks stuff. He's not. Uh, in my view, I agree with you. He's looking into the vision uh, of the feeling that he had. When I say vision, I mean that in that he is in that emotional world. He's and and you'll see him time and time again. First of all, get into the emotion, and then he'll start describing it and choosing the right words because. Like many, many good actors out there, he wants to get hold of the feeling first of all before he starts creating the words and the and the poetry around it. So totally agree there. Uh, yeah, Chase, absolutely agree. Um, disgust uh, on uh, drink again, which is, I think, his acting out what Miss Heard was experiencing or projecting to him. Uh, yeah, disdain um, on the monster. I, I agree, the monster is, is the word that they both use for my guess is the addiction or the pain behind the addiction or the hunger for the, for the alcohol or the drugs that comes with that abyss that, that Johnny is trying to fill. With, with alcohol or drugs at certain times. Uh, what's interesting for me is he plays to the jury, good actor, plays the hot spot of the scene to the jury, those stiff drinks and turns to the jury, doesn't shy away from that, doesn't shade, because he knows that's the thing that the audience are gonna be interested in. And also if he displays that if he's open with that, then they're more likely to feel like he's being open with everything. If he's open with the antisocial stuff, then they're more likely to see him as being honest and truthful. And I think that's a fair, fair bet. And that's an actor's bet as well. If you are open to the audience about what is the worst stuff, they will join you on that journey. If you hide away the worst stuff, they just go, why did we buy a ticket for this? This is rubbish. You know, this is just like watching my aunt or my uncle. You know, it's just boring. So uh, now what's interesting, though, I think, is he holds back on that throw. Like he literally stops it. It doesn't f follow through. And he doesn't follow through with the emotion that, that my guess is he could play, uh, which uh, Amber Heard would have. My guess is he does that because he knows when to hold back. Because if he goes for one of his swing for the fences, barnstorming, character performances of the anger of throwing a vodka bottle, it's going to be a massive spectacle. It's going to be a Johnny Depp character performance rather than what we're getting here, which is the Johnny Depp um, uh, kind of react to the circumstance in a subtle and gentle filmic way rather than the, the Disney animation way. And I'll talk more later on about his swing for the fences performances and that style of acting and the style that you're seeing from him uh, right now. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. Well, I agree with you completely. That's 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 a great almost summing up of the whole thing, really, when you think about it. But compared to his entire testimony up to this point, this is the, his most use of illustrators. He uses them more than any up to this point. We see some other places where he gets a little bit a bit more animated as well. Then as he looks straight ahead, he's recalling what happened in that step by step step structure. Like I was talking about earlier, everything has to be he has to be sure everything is where it should be as he's telling the story because every word is important. The, the head shaking. I agree with you, Greg. That's he's trying to get that scene out of his head, I think. Um, so that's why we see that quick little head shake as part of his inner dialogue going on in that scene. He's he doesn't agree with that, so he's trying to get not that he doesn't agree with it, but it was tough on him. So I think he's trying to get rid of it. It's it's fairly graphic, and he doesn't have a problem staying calm or, or getting excited or getting all angry, even though he's talking about something where he was really mad, he got really mad after it, um, because he's falling back on that persona. I think that's almost a comfort zone for him to, to jump back in and go forward. When you train uh, people in to, to when you train witnesses or you train someone going to, going to go into a deposition, quite often you'll say, 
what you want to do is you want to be you and you want to look as honest as you possibly can. However, to be able to fall back on that, you're almost a different person telling this. So see yourself almost in a third person as you're telling this story, as you're telling these things. So they don't get to your, when they start attacking you, it doesn't come at you. You can um, reply from that per- persona. I usually say character, but that persona that you have there, that's what I, I think we're seeing there. All right, we good? Yeah, I would add one last thing. All four of us have a persona here. This is not 100% of who we are, guys. This is, I think you pointed out all the time, we were living people before we got on this channel. So there's a lot more to us than mm-hmm. what you see here. Same thing with this guy. And uh, I was, uh, um, I was a mess. I was a wreck. I was shaking and I just didn't understand why all this was happening. So... I went behind the bar, I grabbed a bottle of vodka that was there, and a shot glass, and sat at the bar. She was nowhere around, and I poured myself two or three stiff shots of of the vodka, first taste of alcohol I'd had in a long time, and um, then she came down to the bar and found me there and of course started screaming oh you're drinking again yeah the monster and all that um so she reached she 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 walked up to me and reached and grabbed the the bottle of vodka and then just uh kind of stood back and then hurled it at me and and it it uh It just went right past my head and smashed behind me. Uh, So I stood up and I walked behind the bar and there was a larger bottle of vodka, the kind with the handle, you know, on it. I grabbed that and I went and I sat in my seat again I opened the bottle and I poured myself a shot and drank it. Miss Erd was flinging insults uh, left, right, and center, and she then grabbed that bottle and uh, and threw that at me. Um, and the way that the The way that the bar was situated and where Miss Herb was, so if, if, if if I could show you, so if, if this is the bar where the glass was and the bottles, if this was the bar and I'm sitting here like this, she would grab the bottle and she would go, there she went there and so i was leaning like this in the chair looking at her first bottle went then got the other bottle shot takes the second bottle which is the larger one i'm in this position again and my my hand is on the edge of the the bar like like that you know leaning over the fingers like that. And uh, she threw the large bottle and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. And I honestly didn't, I didn't feel the pain at first at all. I felt no pain whatsoever. What I felt was, um, I felt heat, I felt heat and I felt um, as if something were dripping down my hand, you know. Um, And then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed and uh, I was looking directly at my bones. 
All right, Chase, what do you got? There's a couple things here. When he says, I stood up, there's an eyebrow flash, socializing innocence. So he's socializing innocence here. And he's saying Miss Heard was flinging these insults. There's this hand motion using his left hand there. It's just great narration there. And I think Amber's also in that direction from him <clears throat> in the courtroom. And then there's eye closure right when he says that. And I think this is the sincerity of the impact. And he's trying not to absorb the Im insults in his memory. Then he looks the opposite direction away from her. His eyes drop down into this emotional recall position. Uh, this kind of down here, when we move our eyes down there, we're most likely to be feeling some kind of emotion <clears throat> or processing it. But he's comfortable using his body narration. So he's showing us the story with his body. So when you see this and someone's using lots of this body narration or illustration when they talk, watch for it to stop or become absent. And that's a key point in the conversation. Either it's a great one or it might be a red flag. But he's using the, the same gesture uh, that we've seen in the vodka bottle thing. But in Amber especially, there's an increase in blink rate, breathing into her chest instead of her abdomen, which indicates some stress. And there's an emotionless, cold analysis of his movement, just kind of like a head tilt, like a, like a Terminator would, would survey somebody maybe. But Depp is using more telling than showing, which is uncharacteristic of him. And this is when we use words like realized, noticed, saw during storytelling. It's not indicative of deception on its own, but it can indicate that he's now recalling the event in third person. So it called these are called phrases of realization and discernment, if you ever want to look this up. But it's not ever necessary in storytelling unless the POV has not been established. So he shifted uh, POV here is what we're really seeing here. And finally, here's a pattern that is maybe going to shock you as we start moving forward. Right when he says, I'm looking at my bone, he starts smiling. And a lot of us are saying, well, you know, some people smile when they're nervous or smile during the climax of a story. But you're going to see some other times that he smiles. And I want to show you the pattern of that as it starts getting a little bit closer to it. Scott, what do you got? All right. I agree with you completely. And I think that, uh, yeah, some of, those are, some of those I didn't think about. Uh, but these are uh, the illustrators we're seeing are a little bit more. They're 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 not illustrators they're more of, of demonstrative gestures. Like you were saying, Chase, what's the term you always use? Narr narration. Uh, body yeah, narration. Yeah. Ge uh, gesture narr narration or something no, like that. Called it body narration, right? Here. Okay. All right. Anyway, so I call them a demonstrative gestures. Same thing, I guess. So the lip licking and the lip biting, those are his adapters because this is getting a little bit hairy for him. And his eyes are darting around, thinking again about the structure of the descriptions he's given, getting ready to to deliver. So he's, he's preparing those. Now, when we look at Amber, she's showing no grief muscle. She doesn't have any movement in her chin, boss. Her eyes are, are a little bit narrowed, but but not a whole lot. You know, not going on. But if you look at it, it looks like she's been crying. So her, eye, her eyes look a little bit puffy. I don't know if she has or not. It's just what it looks like to me. But if you'll notice, one eyebrow is a little shorter than the other. is a little bit lower down than the other one. And that isn't, that's no expression going on there. That's her normal, that's the way she normally looks. Quite often, even mine are, your ears probably aren't even. Your nostrils probably aren't even. Your eyes probably aren't even. That's with most people. So when you see something like that, people think, oh, she's thinking... Whatever the whole time. No, that's that's fairly normal because um, most everything on your face isn't um, even and of equal size. And you're right, Chase, her breathing uh, is a little bit high, as is her clustered blink rate because she speeds up a little bit and she slows down, stops, and then she'll get one or two and then start going fast again. Almost a flutter, but we see some flutter clusters here in just a little while. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I love the idea of flinging insults and the action, like you were saying, Chase, that goes with that. Because flinging, it's aggressive and careless at the same time. So it frames Heard as both aggressive and careless around that. It's also quite a primal idea, flinging stuff. Um, and, and we'll get this idea of kind of uh, primal bodily secretions and, and being left and put in all kinds of places. It's very kind of the idea of flinging something. It's very antisocial. And this antisocial behavior will, will, you know, rank up over time, build up over time. We get a little stroke of the eyelid 
here, uh, which I would say is self-soothing, uh, after he says shattered everywhere, and we get that piece of body narration there. Of course, he's a great, you know, shall we say mime. He's very good at placing things accurately and setting the scene physically and visually for any audience. Well, of course, any really good modern actor has to be able to do that because on a modern film set, most everything in the film you don't have around you anymore. It's green screen, there's green everywhere, the props aren't there, they're going to be animated in there later on. So the ability of an actor to be able to pretend and act that something is there and hit that mark again again and again and again and again, that's why they're often very, very valuable actors. Not only can they get the story out and the emotion and the barnstorming performance, but they can hit more than their mark. They can create other things in the space. So great example of that. Now, let's look, let's talk about this flinging that we're going to see later on and this idea of him being able to uh, well, there's this battle going on really about the idea of, of drinking and the territory of drinking. And we will see this over time of, of, you know, um, the alcohol is bad, but he goes to get another drink that is territorial aggress aggressive. She then picks up a bottle, throws it at him. That's territorially aggressive. And we'll see that whole thing build over time. So what I want to, what interests me about this is what is the power going on here? That's the question that I start to ask. What is the power going on here? What is the power that one person wants that the other isn't giving? I don't have kind of answers to that, but clearly there's a gap that the alcohol is filling there. And that gap, uh, Amber Heard does not want filled by the alcohol. She wants control of that gap. And maybe she he thinks she should be filling that gap. It's a possibility. That's all speculation. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? I already went. Oh, you already went? I called on you. Yeah. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, all the same stuff with maybe a couple of minor differences. One of the things I'd point out is good actors are not acting at every moment. What I mean by that, Mark, you can address it even more, is the person doesn't have to think about how does my face move at this time. They take on a persona and they change the way they move collectively. And so I think we see some of that in his public persona that is well rehearsed. I'm not saying that that's acting. I'm just saying that well rehearsed persona has the same cadence consistently. He does that searching for change baseline, that down left, down right, internalizing conversation. A lot of introverts do that. I run to them and in, into them in business all the time where they'll look down and look right and look down. It, it's just a way that some people do. I also always say the organism does what made the organism successful. He's a great storyteller. He storytells with his body, Jack Sparrow, all that stuff. He storytells with his body, so he knows how to storytell. Now, that could be a true story or made up story. It doesn't matter. Uh, Chase, I had left hand negative stuff all over again as well. Here's an interesting one. Last time we covered Roundsburg and we said he had this mantra and when he edited and he got in a bind, he was saying, steering wheel dash, those kinds of things. He edits and says bottle, second, thrown without affecting the integrity of the story, which makes you think the story is probably true. It's easy for him to jump through the story easy, easily and to get those details. I agree with you, Mark. That's a self-soothing move as he's thinking about where this goes. Then he goes back to his baseline and he starts to do that running through and looking and telling. And when he hits that, looking at the bone, he freezes. There's a freeze in his movement altogether. And his face kind of elongates and his vowel about bone elongates when he says it. But his blink rate is normal. His breathing is normal. You can see concern in his brow when he says he felt something. And then one of the things, Chase, and I think this is related to what you're talking about with point of view of the story changing, if today I got my finger cut off, all the BS that led up to it would be dramatic and all that. But suddenly, all that doesn't matter. It's this finger. It's just this finger that matters. We would expect a person who made it up to say, and then she went on and on and on. But no, he goes, I almost went into an emotional breakdown and, and, and. It all becomes about him. That's congruent. A couple of things about Amber Heard. Way back when I started doing body language a thousand years ago, we talked about color and about the impact of color on human eyes and that kind of thing. One of the things that used to be a maxim is if a woman wants to appear to be innocent in front of a court, wear yellow. Interesting choice of colors. She does have a little bit of a chin thing going, but it's not vibration of the chin boss. Scott, I agree with you. There's no movement there. It's just kind of pursed. Her lips are narrow in disapproval and her, well, her mouth is narrow. 
And that right eye, I was going to point out the same thing. One of her eyes is more broad than the other, but it's not a change. It's consistent. When you see changes, when you care. Um, and then rarely for me, but I did count blink rate. In 21 seconds, she blinked 14 times and she breathed seven times. That's pretty rapid. So something's up in her head. And then she's got that rigid poised neck, like she's posing for a you know, one of these cheap uh, photo studios where they make you turn your head and sit a certain way. That's all I got. Behind me. Uh, so I stood up and I walked behind the bar and there was a larger bottle of vodka, the kind with the handle, you know, on it. I grabbed that and I went and I sat in my seat again. I opened the bottle and I poured myself a shot and drank it. Ms. Erd was flinging insults uh, left, right and center and she then grabbed that bottle and uh, and threw that at me. Um, and the way that the the way that the bar was situ situated and w w where Miss Herb was, so if 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 I could show you, so if. This is the bar where the glass was and the bottles. If this was the bar and I'm sitting here like this, she would grab the bottle and she would go there. She went there. And so I was leaning like this in the chair, looking at her. First bottle went, then got the other bottle shot takes the second bottle, which is the larger one. I'm in this position again, and my, my hand is on the edge of the, the bar, like, like that, you know, leaning over the fingers, like that, and uh, she threw the large bottle, and it made contact and shattered uh, everywhere. And I honestly didn't, I didn't feel the pain at first at all. I felt no pain whatsoever. What I felt was, um, I felt heat. I felt heat and I felt um, as if something were dripping down my hand, you know. Um, and then I looked down and realized that the, the, the tip of my finger had been severed. And uh, I was looking directly at my bones now. And uh, the, the, the meaty portion of your the inside of your finger, the, um, and it was, it, blood was just uh, pouring out. And at that point, I, 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 I think that I went into some sort of, I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like. But that's probably the closest that I've ever been. I didn't, nothing made sense. And I knew in my mind and in my heart, this is, this is not life. This is not life. <laughs> no one should have to go through this. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, what was, this is, this is the rich person's version of cops. It's just not happening in a um, a trailer park. I mean, this is one of those knock. This somebody gets drunk and starts throwing bottles. How many times have you seen that on there? You know, they come dragging them out. So I don't know why nobody called the cops, but uh, that that's what this is, exa is exactly like. Um, this is an emotional situation. 
uh, as as we as we know, but he's got a pretty low blink rate for that, and so is his breathing. His breathing rate's fairly low too for such an emotional situation. Um, we're not seeing anything that says, from that standpoint, that something was up here. Something is firing off all of his uh, emotions here. So maybe he's that controlled. I don't know, but I don't think he's acting. I think he's really living this. So he's staying calm, keeping his wits about him, and um, that's an again him keeping his head together so he can structure his words the way they should be. Now let's talk about Amber for a second. We're seeing the same thing we did last time, pretty much, but I think she's acting. And we're going to see that a lot in, the, in a few minutes. Because when if certain things he says, those eyebrows pop up like she's shocked almost and, and like it bothers her. I don't think it does. Somebody that would do something like that, listening back to the story is not going to shock her. And I believe him. That's that's why I, get, I feel okay about saying that. And outside of a couple of those eyebrow twitches, nothing. Um, uh, there aren't any micro expressions that I'm seeing that really mean anything. You see a couple little twitches, but nothing that, that actually you can, I don't think you can lock up to anything specific. Um, her, her breathing rate is about the same, breathing the same way. Her blink rates are the same. She's had those little, uh, a couple little clusters here and there. Uh, she's concerned, but she's not concerned. I don't think about him. I think she's concerned about herself. If that is concerned, it's hard to tell with her eyebrows like that. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it's brilliant, man. I fully agree with that. He shifts again back to the you pronoun. He goes from I to you, but only during the socializing of the injury to help people visualize and understand what this happened to you. <clears throat> and if you're a nerd, you can look this up. It's called the shift of referential index to, to technicify that. But Amber goes into internal dialogue when Depp pauses to think about what to say. The moment Depp pauses. She goes into internal dialogue. My opinion, this is either empathy or calculated prediction. You can uh, probably guess which one. I'll leave it up to you. Let me know in the comments what you think or what your intuition says. But when he's saying uh, nothing made sense and I knew in my mind and heart and all this, the expressions are timed perfectly. They appear on the face just as he starts speaking or just before he starts speaking. So he's processing the emotion as he's getting the sentence ready to go, which is truthful. And when he's saying this, this is not life part, the smiling, I think, is nervous. It's matched with a pacifying behavior with his hand, which is made to calm us down or soothe us or regain a feeling of control over the situation. There's adapters on his legs where he's rubbing his hands onto his thighs there. And this is matched with confirmation glances around the room. He's looking around the room for some kind of approval as he's saying, this is not life. This is not what life is supposed to be. But I think this is a truthful statement. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, all I hear when he's talking, I just said this to you guys on the break. This is Marlon Brando in Apocalypse now. All right. I mean, though his speech pattern, he has Marlon Brando in his head here. I mean, given this guy is one of the most talented, in my opinion, again, I, this is all my opinion, but this one specifically, I think he's one of the most talented actors of my lifetime. So just because he can turn into mm. anyone. But I do hear Marlon Brando here, that speech pattern, and he's storytelling. He's going through the right bullets, the right details. Not saying that's a lie by any means. I'm saying his story delivery is good and powerful. I also noticed that he gets to this kind of blank thing. And when he gets to at the point, he pauses more than is normal. And I think we'll find out more later about there's a whole lot that happened after this point, but that probably was a break point for him. And so it's hard for him to get his head around it. He's, but all of his messaging, all of his messaging, to your point, his eye, his blink rate, his brow, his hands, everything is congruent. It doesn't like a bad Kung Fu movie. It looks like he's saying exactly what he's saying. He edits as he speaks, he stops and his hands stop. It's interesting to watch all of this movement and to see all of this play out in that way. I think as you watch him, you can't help but realize that something horrible has happened there. Chase, to your point with her, when she goes to that internal dialogue, I think the internal dialogue is, uh-oh, what is coming up next? Whatever you want to say, whether it's empathy or she's trying to figure out, whatever it is, there's something right in there between them. There's a whole lot of baggage here. And I'll just be as sarcastic as I know how to do and say, I think what I see in her is love and sympathy and hoping he feels better. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think uh, let's talk about Heard first of all. I think we get a bit of both. I think we do get some empathy and we get calculation. Um, 
Look, Johnny Depp is compelling, and I'll come to a moment why he's compelling and how he's, uh, I would agree, Greg, probably the greatest character actor of his generation, but he's not doing the character acting right now. And I'll come to that in a moment. But what happens with Heard? Well, he's he's such a compelling and um, empathetic storyteller here that her head starts tilting to one side as she gets drawn into the feeling. Then she realizes, hang on, I'm meant to be cold and calculating here. And the head straightens. He continues his compelling uh, um, uh, storytelling and the head goes again to the side. He is hypnotic in in this particular style of being Johnny Depp. Now, um, what's this laughter about? I, I believe this particular release of tension is around the absurdity of the unfairness of the situation. We see the same laugh when he's performing in um, in uh, Life's Too Short, Ricky Gervais's show. Go and see that, uh, where he's in Life's Too Short. Um, he's railing at his annoyance of being made fun of at the, at the Golden Globes, as well as his, the other stars. This is Johnny Depp being Johnny Depp in the imaginary, the imaginary circumstance of railing at at uh, Ricky Gervais if he really was offended. So uh, to your point earlier on, Chase, it's it's an ordered psychosis. It's a managed psychosis. It's really Johnny Depp, but he's pretending really well that it's a whole different set of circumstances. So it becomes very, very real for him. Now in this managed psychosis, what is the aggression that we see from him? We see territorial aggression. He flicks his cigarette in Ricky Gervais's glass of water. So he takes territory of an important resource. And then when he gets really angry and can't stand it anymore and starts to cry a little bit. He stands up, he walks away, he kicks a waste paper basket, and then he walks out a little bit more and he turns over a bowl of fruit. And that is as aggressive as Johnny Depp gets when he feels the absurdity of the unfairness. What we don't see in that performance is he being aggressive towards the perpetrator, being violent towards the perpetrator. He is territorial aggressive for sure, but he's violent at other objects. He's violent at other avatars. And that I would say is Johnny Depp being really Johnny Depp in this circumstance where he feels violated. Now, if he, if he were being Johnny Depp doing his character acting, as he would say, he would be getting a big stick and swinging it because that's what he calls his character acting. He just gets the biggest idea he possibly can and he swings for the fences and what he's looking for after, you know, um, cut is for there to be silence on the set that people cannot believe what he's done. He's created utter chaos, uh, utter bizarreness of performance. That's not what we're getting in the courtroom. This isn't a bizarre performance by any, this isn't his character acting. This is Johnny Depp being Johnny Depp in this situation. Yes, he's made up of all kinds of personas, just like I am, just like people, just like Chase is, just like Greg, just like Scott. You could go, oh, you know, Chase is a bit like this person. Oh, Greg's a bit like this person and this person. And you'd probably be right. I'm a bit like a whole bunch of people that I aspired to be and who were who held resource over me. And I thought, well, if I'm like them, I might be successful as well. He's just the same, but it's really him. Now, and uh, for the, the, the meaty portion of your, the inside of your finger, the, um, and it was, it, blood was just uh, pouring out. And at that point, I, 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 I think that I went into some sort of, I, I don't know what a nervous breakdown feels like, but that's probably the closest that I've ever been. I didn't, nothing made sense. And I knew 
in my mind and in my heart. This is, this is not life. This is not life. <laughs> no one should have to go through this. And uh, she entered the bedroom <clears throat> while I was laying on my side of the bed, reading. And she was still rattling off all the wrongs I'd uh, done to her in that particular day and, and how unreliable I am and uh, what a, you know, what a horrible person I was. Um, and I, and I did not, I did not engage verbally nothing. I sat there or laid there reading my book and when that, when she didn't get a jump out of me or a jolt out of me, she got out of bed, she walked around the bed, she came to my side, and uh, again, you know, you, you, you've got, uh, you've got a person who is uh, throwing multiple shots at your at your face, at your head, at your neck, at your, at anything she could hit. So I, I got up out of bed and I grabbed her by the shoulders and I sat her down on the bed. <clears throat> and I said, I'm leaving. Please don't get off the bed. Please don't follow me. Please don't try and stop me. I'm leaving. And she got up off the bed and she squared off at me in the doorway of our bedroom. And I said, what do you, what do you want to do? Hit me again? Would you like to hit me again? And I said, go ahead, hit me. Bam. I just said, did that, is that what you wanted? Would you like another? Bam. There's the second one. And I said, good, now you're done. Grabbed her by the shoulders, walked her to the bed, sat her down and said, don't follow me. Leave me alone. I'm out. I'm gone. I went, I grabbed a few things and I got out immediately and I went to um, my other house on Sweetser. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is among my favorites. Um, this is after he missed her birthday because he had some financial trouble. He found out he's almost, he had lost a lot of money. We'll leave it at that. And he was an hour and a half late to go to her birthday party. And so it turned into chaos. And then he's got a long story before it gets to this. But his baseline is pretty normal when he says no good could come of this. He does the rattling around in the floor and then eye contact. There's an interesting thing here that makes me think volatility is part of their life. You just said it in the break. But he says, I sat her down. That sat is awfully labored. I wasn't sure in the beginning he wasn't, uh, wasn't about to say I pushed her down on the bed. But there's an if you want to know the difference, Listen through this whole clip. He says, I sat her on the bed twice. Listen to the first one and then listen to the second one. It's a pause like he's almost ready to say, I pushed her on the bed, but he doesn't. He says sat. That makes me think that they've got a, a history of volatility. I would say this. Restraint is probably not a smart idea with anybody you're involved with. It probably can equate to domestic in some some just some jurisdictions. You you you. Your, your mileage may vary, as they say. But after he says that, he does a throat clear, which is not usual for him. He does a throat clear after he said sat her on the bed. Then he goes to hard internal conversation. Go compare that to the second. Then he does his brows up to punctuate when he's talking. He's got his forehead already up, and he can raise a brow or two with his forehead up. That is incredible muscle control. I mean, I don't see it in anybody. I say all the time, if you ever want to see some fantastic muscle control, go watch him character act in Willy Wonka, one of those. He can move I think more you're in love with him. And more, more emotions over his face than any person I've ever seen. No, Scott, that's you. 
<laughs> no, I, I swear, I've never heard you talk. And every no, I, podcast you've been on, every time his name comes up, you talk about how great wonderful actor. he is. And I agree with you. He's great. He's he, an awesome actor. He, but, man, you just get all emotional up in there. Oh, on. yeah, I'm all emotional about it. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's about as emotional as I get about, about some <laughs> actor for sure. So, anyway, his brows up, go up and he does that punctuation. And then he's overtly demonstrative. She's sitting there and she almost looks like she's going to cry. You look. Her face is getting narrower and narrower and sagging deeper and deeper. And I think regardless of what kind of crazy volatility you got in a relationship, you got feelings for that person somehow, whether they're love, hate, a mixture of love and hate. And a lot of times in those kind of environments where you get to physically volatile relationships, it's a chemistry experiment. And like I've said many, many times, one or the other probably is not a saint living with a brawler. There's probably a little bit of escalation on both sides. It's never okay to get to physical violence on either side. But that pushing buttons probably is an art form when you're up against each other all the time and already irritate the hell out of each other. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, heard right from the start, blink rate is up on the lead up to the story of uh, the violence. So I would say, you know, we don't know why the blink rate is up because it could be that um she's worried she's anxious about this story being told or she's reliving the story or something else you can think of all kinds of reasons why anxiety uh may well go up on this lead up but this is important because then we get johnny's story about the blows that she put towards him and uh on the second blow where he says there's the second one she's now focused but we get what I would suggest is a slow blink from her. I would say that is a set acceptance and agreement that that event happened. So if there was any question in anybody's mind whether she struck him or not, I would suggest that's a good piece of evidence. That's clearly. I don't know what uh, happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Save time or whatever. Yeah, right. you go. You go and get your stuff. I'll I'll finish this yeah, and okay. then. Who are we going okay. to next? Who's been? Scott's last, right? Okay. Okay. I'm last. I'll, so I'll, I'll call on you and hopefully you'll be back. I'm going to be short. Okay. So you, better, you better get to the Otherwise, freezer. I'll talk for you. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay. I'll Pretty come much. after you, Mark. Oh, oh okay. Okay, great. Uh, so where was I on this? Uh, yeah, look, if there was any doubt in anybody's mind whether it is true that she struck him or not, I would lay good money that she did because of that slow blink of, of recognition. It's a, it's, and it's baselined well because we saw the, the blinks of anxiety or stress beforehand. We saw her focused and not blinking at all before all of that. Great baseline around that. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, when he says, so I get up out of bed, I'm gonna start kind of in the middle of this. He quickly flashes to emotional eye movement just before talking about the decision to get up and leave. Truthful, and it's unconscious behavior. When he says, I grabbed her by the shoulder, some body narration there. So he's showing us just like he does when he's telling other things that are truthful. But right when he's telling her not to follow and that he's leaving, I think he's truthful about his tent and emotion. There's no glabella movement here. This is important. If he's sitting her down and lecturing her, even if he recalled himself yelling or being really mean or angry, you would see this little, the eyebrows come down, the glabella of this muscle right here, squeeze in a little bit. There's no downward movement of eyebrows. And this can often show a person recalling being angry or domineering in situations where they're pretending to be kind and peaceful. And this is helpful for police officers or anybody in conflict resolution when they're talking to people in maybe domestic violence case or something like that. And then he says, you know, she, she squared off at me. Then there's another chin thrust. And I think this is a truthful recollection of the reaction to being physically challenged, which is what we do. We expose our arteries to people when we want to show that we're not fearful. And then the hitting, he's still using body narration. And if he was coached to do this, the attorney, I think, would make sure that he spoke the words so that they appear on the transcript of court records. Instead of just this little narration with his face and showing where it got hit, the attorney would have coached him to say it to where it was in the transcript. Amber shakes her head during this. 
during this discussion about the punching, but she only shakes it very slightly at the second punch. So I think there is something to that. Might have still happened, but there's still something there. Maybe she recalls a different occurrence, or maybe she have hit him differently or with an ashtray instead of a fist or something like that. I don't know. But at the final, when he's saying, don't follow me, there's genuine digital extension into a, what we call a stop gesture. And this is what this little flat hand movement is what we do when we're trying to talk somebody out of something. If it's down at your side and your pocket and your purse, your hand will still stretch out. And if you're trying to get someone to stop something linguistically, your, our hands naturally want to go out like this. So that's what the stop gesture is. And that's all I got. Scott, what do you have? All right. Sorry about that. Not only not only does my camera keep turning off, there's a wasp in here. <laughs> I've been watching him, man. He's getting closer. He's he's making a plan. I don't know what he's planning on doing. But man, he's my, on minion, my minion coming after you. Oh, my God. And to top it all off, I've got Nashville hot chicken tenders up here. Beautiful. Frozen. You know, to keep that you know how to eat, keep Scott. That thing cool. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry I missed that, Chase. I would, I would love to have heard that. All right. Uh, so this is where it gets interesting from a facial expressions uh, point of view. But before that, again, this is just trailer park stuff, man. This is just, this is just cops roll up on, on a, on a call for a domestic. That's what this is. You know, I don't, I don't understand why they're not involved. Why didn't somebody call the cops? She should have done that or he should have done that. Something in, in this case, he should have done that, but he didn't do it. This, but again, this is where it gets interesting from a, from the perspective of facial expressions. And like Greg was talking about, his entire forehead gets involved here. And, it, and these things keep flowing in and out. These move, these movements. And, and I don't, I don't understand how he does it either. It is fascinating. I'm not in love with him like uh, Greg is, but it is fascinating. Uh, but up to this point here, that's the most we've seen in, in this group of videos. But we're going to see it some more in a different way when we get when we, we get down the line a little bit. Um, and it, the, the thing about her at this point, I think what we're seeing her, she's acting. She's pretty much the same as she was. A little bit more head movement. And uh, I don't know what you, you guys were talking about before this. But um, one thing I thought was interesting about uh, all these videos we've seen so far, has anybody seen anybody swallow? No, no, I'm I haven't no. either. I don't know what's up with that, man. Nobody's swallowing in this thing, so that's I'll, I'll end it there. And because uh, I can't focus with this wasp flying around in here, <laughs> you need one of those electrified uh, tennis racket things. Oh yeah, not that, that I advocate the killing of wasps in any oh, way. You're gonna get in trouble Anybody for that, that, Mark. You're in so much trouble. Wasps shouldn't yeah. be killed. <laughs> but I wouldn't want to kill them. I'll catch them and put them outside. Uh, wasps are very, very helpful uh, creatures. Yes, yes they are. Yes. Bless them. And uh, she entered the bedroom <clears throat> while I was laying on my side of the bed, reading, and. She was still rattling off all the wrongs I'd uh, done to her in that particular day and, and how unreliable I am and uh, what a, you know, what a horrible person I was. Um, and I, and I did not, I did not engage verbally nothing. I sat there or laid there reading my book. And when that, and she didn't get a jump out of me or a jolt out of me, she got out of bed. She walked around the bed. She came to my side. And uh, again, you know, you, you, you've got, uh, you've got a person who is, uh, throwing multiple shots at your at your face at your head at your neck at your at anything she could hit so i i got up out of bed and i grabbed her by the shoulders and i sat her down on the bed <clears throat> And I said, I'm leaving. Please don't get off the bed. Please don't follow me. Please don't try and stop me. I'm leaving. And she got up, 
off the bed and she squared off at me in the doorway of our bedroom. And I said, what do you, what do you want to do? Hit me again? Would you like to hit me again? And I said, go ahead, hit me. Bam. I just said, did that, is that what you wanted? Would you like another? Bam. There's the second one. And I said, good, now you're done. Grabbed her by the shoulders, walked her to the bed, sat her down and said, don't follow me, leave me alone, I'm out, I'm gone. I went, I grabbed a few things and I got out immediately and I went to um, my other house on Sweetser. <clears throat> Had you ever been accused of physically abusing a woman before this point? No. How would you describe the impact of these allegations at the time they were made? And Arnold, if you could please take this down. I, I've, I've, I've felt ill. I felt sick. I mean, I'm sick in a sense that but I There was no tr truth in it. There was no truth in it whatsoever. And the fact that it was coming down on me so hard um, and so quickly and how it, it, it gained momentum around the world. Um, And then you notice people looking at you differently. And then you notice calls stop coming from agents and producers and um, that sort of thing. This was this was a this was a bef this was before, in fact, the Me Too movement had. Uh, had uh, come around. This was a while before that, so I, I couldn't have expected the Me Too movement to happen, but um, once that happened, then it, it just went into skyrocket mode. So you're, you're showered with, uh, uh, with, you know, you're running between drops of lava. You're trying to run between raindrops that are that 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 kill you um, and destroy you. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'll be quick on this one. A couple of things. When he's asked, "Did you ever assault? Have you ever assaulted anyone?" His blink rate goes through the roof. Does that mean he has? Not necessarily. It simply means fight or flight. It means that, and it's the first time we've seen his blink rate increase in this entire thing. He's being asked a hard question, a question that is accusatory, not simply saying, tell me your story. And then after that, and after that, and after that, it's asking him a pointed question, his blink rate does increase. And he says no twice. And then he breaks to internal voice. If you ever want to know what a thousand yard stare is, that's what he's doing it when he hits internal voice. When he goes to an internal conversation, he's not sitting there dwelling. His eyes just go out of focus. He's internal altogether as he's thinking through how to say this. And then he goes with a single eyebrow to drive. It was everything. A single eyebrow in the middle of all that forehead stuff. And we're going to see that single eyebrow rise more than one time as a real strong emphasis for him when he hits something. And then when he says this was, you see his points of his brows on the inside rise up. We we equate that with sorrow. Overall, the body language is congruent with the message he's delivering. And then he does some evocative storytelling. It was like lava. Now that's, you know, that's actor talking. That's a guy who's larger than life talking. I wouldn't say it was like lava. I'd say it was like a 
storm, something like that, because I don't talk the same way. Scott, what do you got? All right. This is a really, really important uh, time for him because this is what the whole thing is based on, him losing money because of the article she had put in whatever the uh, news thing was. So he's got a lot of full eye contact going on here, and um, he's shown a lot of focus and attention. Um, because he's trying to explain perfectly, as cl clearly as he can, for that jury to hear why um, they're there. This is the reason they're there. So that's really important to him from from the perspective of structure and making it stick. Now, another thing, like you guys are talking about how charismatic he is and and all that, how much Greg loves him, is he those long pauses in there when someone is speaking and they wait between words. Then you're just waiting for him to talk. So everybody just kind of leans in and starts listening real hard. So I believe that's part of what he's doing here as well, making sure he gets every point uh, across. And um, the question on, on everyone's mind here is, did you hit her? You know, did he really do this? Did he really hit her? And we're not seeing as many uh, as... We're not seeing as many pauses as we saw before because he's trying to get through that story and make sure everything gets laid out so people understand it. Um, he's hitting each point, and every one of these points that he's hit, that he's prepared for, that's where we see that eye and uh, forehead engagement happen again. We see those getting uh, coming into play there. His diction is really clear. Everything's really clean here. His voice tone is clean and clear. His diction's spot on. And he's not talking too fast, but he's talking a little bit faster. His voice tone is a little bit higher because he's, his energy level is up to talk about this and to get this point across. Uh, and we see more in his brow at this point, I think, that we have up uh, so far. So, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so, good answer, I think, to that, uh, that question. No, no. And, and the second no isn't an emphatic no. It's more like the real answer. The first one is the answer that he knows he needs to give. And the second one, I believe, because it's what we would call pathetic, it kind of goes down in, in its, in its kind of energy at the end. That's more Johnny Depp really giving the answer that no, this didn't happen. So good answer there. Uh, he takes time, again, to look for the feelings and look for his thoughts. Again, go and look at Hunter S. Thompson, one of his heroes. Go and look at Keith Richards, one of his heroes. And you will take both of them poets, you know, people who pick the exact words to use to have the maximum impact. He, they both do this, looking down to locate and take time to find the right word and then bring it out. And so, of course, you get this kind of, let's say, Byronic um, poetry coming out of, of fire, skyrockets, um, volcanoes being showered by, by raindrops of molten lava. I mean, it's just e e extraordinary stuff. And, and no surprise that um, Johnny Depp has played those Hellraisers, the Earl of Rochester in, um, in The Libertine, uh, which was written by an old friend of mine, Stephen Jeffries, sadly, sadly gone. Love you, Steve. And, you know, the mad, bad, dangerous to know, extraordinary characters who are fiery. He's, he's linked with all those things. So we get those kind of fire metaphors coming, coming in there. Um, yeah, heard. Well, she's breathing in the rhythm of his speech. She's utterly hypnotized by this. Who, who wouldn't be? Because it's completely poetic and it's, it's performed, you know, quite brilliantly. So even she is enraptured, enraptured by this and, and she's meant to be against him. So it's very difficult not to be pulled into his influence and persuasion here. But all the same, I think his first answer had a lot of credibility, had a lot of truth to it. Uh, Chase, what do you think on this one? Yeah, I agree with all of you guys. I'll just cover a couple things here. When he's saying the world's coming down on me so hard, you'll see a smile right, right when he's talking about that. And I've actually seen a few expert experts uh, call this deceptive on online. But this is literally what he's done every time that he's mentioned being injured. Every single smile is a social injury or a physical injury. Every time, I think throughout the entire nine hours. I don't know if I saw any uh, any exceptions to that. But he's describing an, some kind of injury, and there's a smile with that. And 
we'll cover more on this in a second, but he's saying it's gained momentum around the world. There's another smile it's communicating and discovering an injury. And then he talks about being hurt emotionally and he shifts back into the you pronoun to help you identify with it as he's done every time he's described receiving the injury or realizing the injury. And then finally, Another shift right at the end here from I and discussing my life into you. So it's easier for people to get and see themselves inside of that story. And I think finally here, when he says, I felt ill, I felt sick. There's eye closure where he's avoiding the, the feeling of it. And there's emotional accessing his eyes go down into the emotional area. And I think this is mostly truthful here. <clears throat> Had you ever been accused of physically abusing a woman before this point? No. No. How would you describe the impact of these allegations at the time they were made? And Arnold, if you could please take this down. I, I've, I've, I've felt ill. I felt sick. I mean, I'm sick in a sense that. But I, it, there was no tr truth in it. There was no truth in it whatsoever. And the fact that it was coming down on me so hard um, and so quickly and how it, it, it gained momentum around the world um, and then you notice people looking at you differently. And then you notice calls stop coming from agents and producers and um, that sort of thing. This was, this was a, this was a, Bef this was before, in fact, the Me Too movement had uh, had uh, come around. This was a while before that, so I, I couldn't have expected the Me Too movement to happen. But um, once that happened, then it it just went into skyrocket mode. So you're you're showered with, uh, uh, with, you know, you're, you're running between drops of lava. You're trying to run between raindrops that are that 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 kill you um, and destroy you. If it's in dangle mode. Mr. Depp, have you ever physically assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Have you ever sexually assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Certainly not. What have you lost as a result of Miss Heard making these allegations against you? Nothing less than everything. Nothing less than everything. Chase, what do you got? Right at the, have you ever sexually assaulted, misheard? There's a smile. And that smile is going to creep a whole lot of people out. My opinion is that this smile that we're seeing here is being asked a ridiculous question. That's something that he couldn't even fathom. It's like me asking Greg if he kidnapped a giraffe last week. He'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun on it. No, no, possible. <laughs> so I think he finds it laughable, ridiculous. As a second option, I think this may invoke the memory of their physical relationship, not the fighting one, the other one, which he may be smiling about. Then he prefer, performs this kind of long mental search, moving around, takes all the time he needs. Like every, I wish every deponent I've ever spoken to uh, would do this 
uh, and you can't, it's hard to get people to do it. <clears throat> but this is kind of the file clerk running around and pulling files when the eye is moving around. The little file clerk is running around to get what it needs. Twice in there, it's hard into emotional accessing, processing the emotional tone of the answer to the question. So I want to talk about him repeating this phrase right at the very end. People rep repeat phrases like this for a few reasons. They're told to do it. Uh, they have this one phrase as a key message, and they want to really hammer that into the audience. They truly feel the weight of the phrase, and that's what I think we're seeing here. I don't think it was coached. I don't think it was some key thing he had on a post-it note on in the weeks leading up to this on his fridge. And he offers it the second time with an upward tone, an upward tone, as if that's all I can think of. That's the only way I could say it. I don't think he planned on saying it twice. He says it again because it's the truth to him. And the upward tone is just kind of an apology for having nothing else or no other way to say it. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. The never, never, the first never, very firm, very assertive, got no problem with that. Second never, yes, there is this glint of delight. Now, people out there might go, oh, it's Jupiter's delight, that one. It's nothing like Jupiter. It has nothing to do with that whatsoever. That looks completely different. Go back to our other videos where you'll be able to see Jupiter's delight in a whole bunch of people. It's, it's only on one side of the face. This is full delight. There is a glint in his eye. Uh, I would go, I'm going to go with your second option there, Chase. I think it was if it was the first option, we might even get a laugh from him of the absurdity. I think, and, and maybe you're going to disagree with me further down the line, I would love that because I'm always open to, to new ideas and what somebody else thinks because it makes all of us better thinkers. But I would expect a laugh from him if it were the absurdity of the question. I think it's him envisaging the idea of sexual and and his you know former partner there uh, heard a uh, poetic answer at the end nothing less than everything that's a piece of poetry of course it is very immense in its scope but he's going for big money and so i think it does a couple of jobs it fulfills the poetic part of him and you know it fulfills the part of him that's looking for i don't know 50 million or something like that which is probably not a lot compared to actually what he's lost uh you know in potential potential damages uh if it turns out that um that it goes in his favor here that's a cheap deal 50 million uh, i would think uh, scott what do you got on this one all right let's pay attention to that head shake no when he says never that's that's fairly uh i mean even at a gut level you can tell that that's that that i would believe that's true even from a gut level level and um both of them are strong and he also says, certainly not. He doesn't say absolutely not. Not that there's a, a thing that says because you use the word absolutely, it means you're, you're not being honest, you're being deceptive. But we sure see the word or hear the word absolutely quite often when someone's being deceptive. Um, so I don't know what the validity of that is there, but still, sorry, the hot chicken just fell off my camera. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't it. see any, yeah, <laughs> I don't see any deceptive cues in this at all. And uh, when he's asked uh, that, when he says I've uh, well, ask when he says I've lost uh, nothing less than everything, I think he might be right if he doesn't get a, a gig soon. So because I think he's kind of headed for the money problems. And again, uh, this is really important part of his case, and he's trying to to get this spot on. And I'm going to kill that little thing with my shit with my Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the last we ever see of him. Yep. Yeah. He's, he probably has go, will go into anaphylactic shock. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Tax his neck. That's yeah. it. There you got it? Yeah. Now we'll be on, we'll be on trial. Yeah, now, for all for now, we're getting, now we're getting canceled. Yeah. Send him to her. wasp heaven with my Kindle. <laughs> wow. This, this was brought to you by Kindle. Probably the best wasp heaven <laughs> you'll ever need. No <laughs> Wow. Are you finishing? Are that you was finish? close. Nah, I'm finished there. I think I, that pretty I, much. I, I only have a few things. Um, his blink rate goes up in the beginning, of course, when he's asked a hard question again. Did you assault? I think, and, and Chase, you can change my mind as we get further in. I think every time we see that nervous smile, it's not just a nervous smile. It's laughing at the absurdity of self and where this thing has gotten to. I think human beings love the 
love to see people fall from great heights. It's why this stuff is all so interesting. I mean, there's millions of, of stories, you know, the Davos and Icarus thing, the guy flies too close, the sun falls, all that stuff is deep rooted in our psyches. The other thing we're going to watch with this is guaranteed the comments are going to be just like this. Some people are on his mm. side, some are on her side, and we're scumbags one way or the other. It'll be interesting to see which way this time and who's paying us. Cause you know, we, we obviously the could McCann's. use the money. We could obviously use the money. Soros we're waiting for that yeah. Soros check. So we're waiting. So bring us some money. Come on, George. But the most interesting of all the body language in this entire thing, and Chase, I agree with you, seeing his eyes dart and look around, he goes to places he hasn't gone up in his up in his visual memory and all those places he's rolling around. But look at his forehead. It's smooth as he's telling you the story about everything that's happened to him and how devastating it's been. It looks like lifeless forehead compared to everything else he's had in here. Lots of movement in his forehead. Otherwise, it goes flat. And then he goes, nothing short of everything. Nothing short of everything. He's fallen from great heights. And quite literally, Mark, like you said, I, I read that he's worth 400 million or whatever the number is. But $50 million could be a drop in the bucket compared to two movies. Who knows? So big deal. I'll leave it at that. If it's in dangle mode. Mr. Depp, have you ever physically assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Have you ever sexually assaulted Miss Heard? Never. Certainly not. What have you lost as a result of Miss Heard making these allegations against you? Nothing less than everything. Nothing less than everything. I don't know why I said, I don't know